Boa tarde a todos os amigos. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon for the Brazilian. Good evening for American, England and the others. Uh, welcome to WNU 2020. We are going to talk uh, this afternoon um, about uh, supply chain uh, and opportunity. Um, we have uh, in this panel uh, the most important companies uh, in the world part participate. And we have Mr. Greg, Mr. Greg Kaiser. He is a senior project manager at the World Nuclear Association and is the staff director of the Supply Chain Working Group. Greg has a degree in economics and politics from the University of Cambridge and began his career with the UK Atomic Energy Authority. He undertakes market research and analysis of the nuclear power supply chain and has worked on quality management and on export control issues. He is the lead author and coordinated the Association World Nuclear Supply Chain Report. He is currently working on an industry chain for answering the quality of supplier certification. Welcome, Greg. Thank you very much to stay with us. Uh, I will uh, please. The you can. The word is your, and you have uh, um, your time. Take your time to present your very beautiful word work that you make in WNA with the supply chain uh, report that you have just published. Welcome, Greg. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, um, <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the uh, World Nuclear Association. Well, uh, the World Nuclear University, I should say. It's part of the World Nuclear Association. Um, this short course online um, in Brazil, but I know we've also got uh, friends from other Latin American countries. So I, I shall start uh, sharing my screen with the uh, presentation that I have, um, and I hope uh, it will be uh, a, a useful thing for, for everyone. Um, so <clears throat> the, the first thing to say is that um, um, you know, the supply, the, the supply chain in the nuclear industry is a really important area. There are a number of factors here, um, and um, I'm, I'm going to look at some of the challenges that we have. These challenges are interrelated. We have, on the one hand, some market challenges in the world, uh, quality challenges, and uh, in particular, um, the, the, the problem of uh, counterfeit uh, and fraudulent suspect items. Uh, that sometimes inter inter interferes into the uh, supply chain. I'm then going to look at more detail about quality management, because that's a big issue for, for, for the uh, supply chain at the moment. And for companies wanting to join the nuclear industry, they need to have a really good quality system in place. And that, I think, also needs to be seen in terms of overall excellence in performance. That is excellence in, in uh, human uh, performance, in uh, production performance, uh, and of course, you have to have economical and efficient performance. Point I'm, I'm going to cover in the presentation will be a few takeaways for you. So how can nuclear stay competitive? We have, uh, uh, we have to live in the marketplace. Um, uh, there, there is no, <laughs> no other way uh, we have to sell electricity in the market. And ensuring this is an interrelated challenge. Um, we have to overcome uh, some economic obstacles. 
We have to make sure we have the capability in place in the supply chain to be able to furnish the goods and the equipment, the uh, uh, services that are required to keep nuclear power plants operating. And there are also quality challenges, as I also mentioned. So these are all interrelated issues. Uh, mention has already been made to the World Nuclear Association's report on the supply chain. Um, we've had one just coming out uh, just uh, <clears throat> in the last two months, um, the outlook for 2040. And I will talk a little bit about that. But this is the fourth such report in uh, the last few years. So we, we started off uh, in, in 2012. We then had another uh, report two years later and two years after that. And we've had a little bit of a gap in between the last report in 2016 and the one just published today, uh, this, this year um, in, uh, in September uh, on uh, uh, the uh, World Nuclear Supply Chain, uh, the outlook up to 2040. Now, what is the nuclear supply chain? We can divide it into tiers into um, sections as it were. So at the top of the supply chain, we would have what what's, would be known generally as a technology vendor. In other words, this is the reactor vendor normally uh, for a, a nuclear steam supply system. It's the reactor vendor that is really putting together the whole uh, system. It is not just the vendor, it is usually the system integrator as well. Now those roles can be different in some other industries, but in the nuclear industry, they tend to come together. Then further down, we have original equipment manufacturers, and these are people supplying particular parts of the system. Um, they may be pumps and valves, for example, or uh, <coughs> uh, various other elements of the, the steam supply system. As you can see here, I've divided the steam supply system on the um, um, uh, left-hand side, as you can see it, uh, you can look at the reactor pressure vessel. Inside the reactor pressure vessel, vessel, there will be rod cluster control assembly. That will control the control rods. Those control rods are made out of a complex alloy, and those alloys are formed from various uh, uh, metals um, and other elements. So that the, 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 the tier three is of, of particular importance. And usually the, um, the, the, the regulator wants to know what's going on up to about tier three. Um, but nonetheless, the subcomponents that go into the part of uh, a, a, sub, a subsystem or a subassembly are of course also important. Um, and you have then fabricators uh, in tier five, pro people processing uh, the, the materials, and then you've got the raw material suppliers at the bottom of the pyramid. So all these tiers need to be qualified to very high standards. And they are all interrelated because the tier one, tier two, um, uh, customer has, has to uh, uh, give the specification down the line to the other tiers in the system. And that tier one uh, company, which would normally be the reactor vendor, um, is, is uh, working uh, uh, to the uh, operator or the developer of the project. So that tier one reports to the ultimate customer, which is the operator or licensed uh, operator of the nuclear power plant itself. So we have a licensed operator. We have a, a flow down of requirements. Specification has to be passed on to each level of the supply chain. There is an issue there of managing the interfaces between all these different organizations. And uh, that all leads to the delivery to the licensed operator of the complete system. 
and overseeing the licensed operator, of course, is the safety regulator, the nuclear safety regulator, who wants to make sure everything is going all right. And that safety regulator and the licensed operator will specify hold points in the supply system so that there are points in the production where the production must be halted for an inspection at a particular point. And this can be itself a difficulty because, of course, if the inspection has to involve the licensed operator, everything has to be well coordinated, otherwise production will, will, will be interrupted. Um, so the, the license operator may well use a third party to um, undertake the inspection and testing or to oversee the, the testing. So all these things have to be managed in uh, conjunction with another, one another. It's a very complex system. A nuclear power plant is a huge complex project to, to build. And it's equally a complex project to run because every moment that you are not running the power plant, not producing electricity, you're not making any money. And yet you're spending money on the maintenance or the downtime that uh, you are undertaking, uh, undertaking at that time. So those hold inspection points, as I said, need to be looked at. And at the end of the day, um, everything has to meet the specification that's originally part of the design, uh, which was approved by the safety regulator right at the start. And there can be many years between the approval of the design and the actual production uh, of those uh, uh, different uh, bits of equipment that make up that design. So it is really a very complex process. It, you know, there's a pile of <laughs> contracts. If you printed them all out, you know, it would go from the floor to the ceiling and bigger probably. So what do we need at the end of the day? For, to achieve safety, we need quality. And to achieve quality, we need to integrate the management of all these layers, all these tiers of suppliers and uh, make sure that everyone is working to the same set of requirements uh, so that there's no confusion and no delays come into the uh, equation. So what about a little bit about the economics? <clears throat> well, a reactor can be very different uh, in different places. The costs can be very, very different. In China, the costs are uh, considerably lower than in Europe. But if you were to build a Chinese reactor in Europe, the, di the difference would, would narrow. It wouldn't be such a big difference in, in cost. It would come down a bit because European costs have to be, uh, nothing, not everything can be made in China. You know, you, even if a lot of it was made in China, you'd still have a lot of operations and activities based in Europe. So when we break down the how those costs build up on a project, a nuclear power plant project, say of a <clears> thousand <throat> uh, thousand megawatts, a gigawatt size nuclear reactor, in other words, we can see that quite a lot of that cost comes out of, is, is involved in construction and installation works. And also, if you look at it in a slightly different way, about half of it in terms is, is, is equipment. Now, these two pie charts are looking at cost breakdown in two different ways. One is looking at the things that are being produced. So there's the equipment, the construction materials, the services, labor services on site and project management services and fuel for the reactor, the first fuel load for the reactor. Those are the things that are going into the reactor. And you can see that, as I said, 48% approximately, it could be a bit more, it could be a bit less, would be made up of equipment. And then you have the activities on the, the other pie chart. So the activities are things like uh, site development and civil works. The civil works are like the earthworks, putting in the drainage, uh, the roads and so on. 
you have the main construction of buildings, you have the design, architecture, architectural services and activities, the engineering, the licensing activities. So all of these come together to make up the cost of a nuclear power plant. And when you <clears throat> look at, sorry, and when you look at the, uh, the way it's divided up, you've got uh, um, uh, the, the traditionally, you also look at the nuclear island as at, uh, once part of the plant, the conventional island, which is uh, the, the turbine hall and other things like that, and balance the plant, which is a lot of buildings and, and services that uh, around the nuclear power plant. So it's a huge operation and you, you're doing it currently in Brazil uh, with, uh, at Angra. Um, and, um, you know, it, 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 it's a major, major project in any, uh, in any way you look, want to look at it. Now, going on a little bit to the market, um, I want to draw your attention to this, uh, this uh, chart here. Um, what we've seen over the last few years is a gradual decline in the number of companies who have the <clears throat> certificate for nuclear work issued by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME. It's just one indicator of what has been happening in the market. Because as you know, a lot of projects are being built in China, but also a lot of projects were canceled in Europe. Um, and uh, there, you know, there is a, a mix of work out there and there's not enough real work for what we'd like in the industry. So companies have been finding themselves a little bit disappointed and they have to pay for this certificate. Uh, they have to pay the Association, the American Society for Mechanical, Mechanical Engineers, ASME, for a certificate, uh, for a certification that they are of nuclear quality at their, at their uh, works in their company. And so when the orders don't come through, it's not worth it for some companies to carry on. And this is mean, means that it's shrinking the supply chain a little bit. It's not a huge amount of shrinkage. As you can see, it's, it's gone down from around 400 to around um, 300 over the last few years in terms of those certificates. Um, those companies could come back in again, of course. I mean, you know, if they thought there was business there, they may, might well come in. But the general outlook at the moment is not so good for the nuclear industry because uh, the, the number of big projects are not being ordered. Um, as uh, much as maybe we would like in the World Nuclear Association. <clears throat> Looking forward, however, World Nuclear Association has uh, prepared uh, three scenarios. Now, those scenarios are set out in our uh, nuclear fuel report and also set out in the supply chain report that I mentioned has been published just recently. And we have three of them. We have a reference scenario, which is a sort of business as usual type scenario, whereby uh, the, 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 the nuclear industry stays at roughly the same level as it is now, proportionately from, in terms of what uh, the, the, the uh, uh, energy supply, um, uh, about 10% of the energy supply for, 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 for electricity. Um, is, is comes from nuclear energy. So that's the reference scenario. It's a sort of, uh, it's, it's great, gradually rising uh, according to that scenario that we, we put forward to 2040. But as you can see, obviously there is quite a lot of certainty in the next few years because we know how many plants are going to be ordered, uh, <laughs> um, you know, or built because, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, the future, uh, the future is fairly clear in the near term, but further ahead, it's much more uncertain. And that's where we have both a lower scenario and an upper scenario. The lower scenario obviously sees a lot of retirements. Plants that would have been operating uh, have, don't have their lives extended 
and they come out of service. So in many European countries, they are gradually running down the number of nuclear power plants in their country. Uh, that's obviously not the case in China. In China, it's rising. Uh, in Russia as well, they're building new power plants. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that's all, all good news, but that doesn't offset the possible retirements. And a big market is in the United States of America, of course, where they've <clears throat> they've got um, traditionally they've had around 100 nuclear power nuclear reactors in the United States, but some of these are coming under a lot of economic pressure from the low price of gas, and it's not being economic to extend their lives or to build new power plants. So this is the story for the lower scenario. In the upper scenario, of course, this is more optimistic. And it could change very easily because we know nuclear is really good as a, a mitigation tool for reducing greenhouse gases. So if we want to really reduce greenhouse gases um, and keep the lights on uh, in, instead of relying on uh, uh, solar or wind power, which uh, are more intermittent sources of energy, we need those. But we, we need nuclear as well to, to make sure that we have the reliability in place in the energy system. So there could be a big change um, at the, towards the end of the 2020s, and we could see quite a rise in the uh, number of uh, nuclear power plants around the world. And that would include Brazil, and I'll mention that in a minute. So that chart just now, was in gigawatts, so that is electrical capacity. But now I'm going to look at the same scenarios, the reference scenario and the upper scenario in terms of capital expenditure. So this is the investment that would be needed to build those power plants, to build that new capacity. And here we see that uh, approximately half the investment would take place in the 2020s and another half in the 2030s. So there's quite a difference in, in the two scenarios. The reference scenario we see coming up for 972,000 <clears throat> million US dollars. So that's just below 1 trillion US dollars. And then the uh, capital expenditure in the upper scenario sees well over 1 trillion, in fact, $1.7 trillion of investment in the plants under that scenario. Now, <clears throat> we can also divide those, uh, that, that, that capital expenditure into domestic projects and international projects. So what I mean by a domestic project is, this is a, you know, a project in Russia, which is being supplied by Russian companies, almost, you know, almost the whole of it, or in China being supplied mostly by Chinese companies. Equally, in the United States, they could supply a lot of the plant <laughs> with, with, uh, with domestic equipment, but some things in the United States have to be imported now. They can't manufacture everything. So here we have the start of the potential for international procurement of equipment. And in the report that we've issued uh, on the world nuclear supply chain, we think that the international procurement market for equipment could be around $288 billion uh, accumulated between now and 2040. So of that, uh, that uh, uh, one, let's say $1 trillion, one <clears throat> less, less than a third will be international procurement. And if you remember my pie charts of cost breakdown, there's another 20% or so that involves the construction costs where a lot of that is local labor, local materials, domestic materials. So even, even on international projects, there will be a lot of local content in the, in the project. To go on now to the uh, quality challenges, 
I've mentioned that the, the market conditions haven't always been good in some parts of the world, such as Europe and North America, and companies have lost staff uh, because of retirements or redundancies. And um, with too few orders, they can't uh, um, invest sufficiently to keep up the nuclear capability. And we've had that erosion, as I said, in the certification. And equally, another challenge is the fact that the suppliers are not all the same level. So some new entrants in China are still learning how to do it properly, as it were. Um, so it's costing them to get up the learning curve. But, you know, we're, we're expecting China to do much more internationally in the near future. So they, they, they have come on leaps and bounds and they've got, you know, so many power plants now under construction and operating in China that they've really got a good industry there. And we've also got different quality management systems around the world. There's not enough harmonization there in how you look at quality control. And it also is expensive for the nuclear business to do this. And management capability here is the key. According to the Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, a report they issued, they're saying that if they look at the past performance of nuclear projects, where there have been delays or cost overruns, most of these problems can be traced back to managerial mistakes rather than technical ones. It's not the technology that's really a problem, except that it's quite a complex project to start off with, involving a lot of different bits of equipment. But it's managing that challenge that has been the difficulty in the view of the Nuclear Energy Agency. And it suggests that um, the supply chain in the nuclear industry could benefit from the experience in um, <clears throat> aerospace uh, projects, uh, you know, and particularly the defense projects where they have a special quality management system in place, which I will describe in a minute. I also said I'd <clears throat> mention the problem of counterfeit fraudulent and suspect items because there have been issues around that that uh, safety regulators have been concerned about. And um, uh, we, we have the following definitions here. Counterfeit items are imitations of legitimate project products. Fraudulent are where you've maybe got <coughs> a signature on a certificate that uh, shouldn't really be there. They didn't really test it correctly and they've uh, put a, a certificate there that's not uh, correct. And suspect items are those where there's obviously some suspicion that there's fraud or counterfeiting going on. Um, and when we look at how, these, how this classification works out. We can see that you've got the vast majority of items are going to be quite genuine. Some of those items may be not conforming to specification and need to be rectified as in order to conform to specification. So that this, this problem in that area, in this non-conforming area is where we, we need that quality management system in place because that eliminates the non-conformity. If, if, if you've got a good quality management system in place, you pick up the problems quickly and you can rectify them quickly. And then inside that non-conforming box, you've got those where there's been some deliberate uh, 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 problem uh, arising, an, uh, an issue that uh, is uh, the, the company has... Um, uh, bought a part that uh, is not the genuine part or has uh, in some way falsified some paperwork or something like that. And this is a real problem that needs to be dealt with. And um, therefore, in an environment where the business uh, sector <clears throat> is uh, uh, um, 
compromised by poor quality and poor conformity to specifications for whatever reason, um, you're going to have problems in the supply chain and you're therefore going to have potential delays and difficulties in the uh, new project. And that is a serious issue that needs to be looked at in every country, not just, <coughs> not just newcomer countries, but all countries may have this problem, even very well developed countries, as we know. So it's a small, small area uh, of problem, but it, it has been found to be a problem in a wide range of types of equipment and types of supply. As I can, you can see here, the, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has received reports uh, of uh, structural items being counterfeited or fraudulently uh, uh, certified, mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, electronic goods, particularly uh, problematic because um, it's, it's difficult to find <laughs> out. There, there is a, a, a reuse of old equipment in the electronics industry sometimes materials even and, uh, and in services such as inspection and testing services. All these have been problematic in the past. Potential solutions are of course, that we need exceptional performance from our suppliers. You've got to have a quality management system. You've got to have good human performance. You've got to run a safety culture and integrating all that is basically down to having a, a, a business excellence model. Because without integrating these things, then you know you, a company could fall short in one or area, one or other area. So <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about that quality management system. Um, the quality management system, obviously, it's part of a cycle where you you you're you're planning setting out your plan to do how you're going to do things. You actually then undertake and implement that plan. You check how you've performed on that plan, and then you adjust it or act upon it to make a change for the next plan, for the future plan. So this is a cycle. And I've also given you a definition of quality assurance and quality control. And I'm sure that um, Abdan will, will make these slides available to you uh, for, the, for those who uh, uh, want to, to uh, make reference to them in the future. Um, the quality management system, again, has to uh, cover the whole range of activities. Um, and the typical standard for quality management is the ISO 9001 standard, which is uh, produced by the <coughs> International Organization for Standardization. And most companies have a, uh, have a, a certificate that says that they, they have an ISO 9001 quality management system in place. But we need something more in the nuclear industry. And so what we have here is showing how ISO have now developed another standard that, you know, uh, builds on the ISO 9001. It's called ISO 19443. And this does a little bit more than ISO 9001 um, uh, and requires more things that uh, a nuclear supplier needs to, to look at. So if you are thinking, if you are a company listening to this uh, uh, event and um, you say, well, maybe I'd like to explore the nuclear industry. Buying a copy of ISO 19443 will actually be quite helpful to you um, because it does tell you in a, just a few pages the areas that you need to work on to become a, 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 a you know, capable of uh, joining the nuclear industry and producing really high quality goods. And on the other side of this diagram here, um, what I've got here is that uh, 
we have uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency have got some guidance. And then we have the relationship between, in the American system, the uh, regulations put down by the US government and the uh, um, requirements spelt out for suppliers um, by the uh, um, <clears throat> American Society for Mechanical Engineers, the ASME, as I mentioned. Okay, the idea that nuclear industry should look a little bit more like the aerospace industry. So we have in the aerospace, they've got their own standard. So the AS9, 1100 standard takes the place of what I mentioned, the ISO 19443 standard in nuclear. So this standard complements the ISO 9001 with additional requirements. Then you have uh, an association, the International <coughs> Aircraft Quality Group, which provides guidelines and best practice. There's a special industry performance program that checks on suppliers and so on. We don't have this yet in the nuclear industry. We've got the basis for it in ISO 9, 19443, but we need <clears throat> to look a little bit further. And I do want to mention that we have a, uh, a, a number of companies have signed a memorandum of understanding to try and put together a system a bit like the aerospace system. And you can see here that EDF and Framatome have been involved in this. Um, uh, 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 and other companies as well, Rosatom as well from Russia. So there's there's a number of initiatives underway, and I'll be happy to answer questions on that. Um, it, that we're talking about possibly having uh, a system to uh, make sure that the auditors for a certificate of quality management. Um, know what really what they're doing, that they're capable of doing the job and that the industry can to some extent control those auditors. I won't go into that in much more detail, it's too complicated. Um, sorry, but so what we've got basically is a system at the moment in, in evolution. We have the ISO system and we have the ASME system, the uh, the, the basically American system. And um, both of these are potential, potentially very good, obviously. But we're, we're still working on that ISO system to try and get away from just a national set of regulations uh, and standards into a more international harmonized approach. That's something that the World Nuclear Association is very keen on. So to finalize, this, uh, this talk, um, how do you achieve excellence? Um, the key is to try and avoid having conflicting objectives. So the, the, the obvious story is, well, if you want very high quality, it's going to cost you a lot of money, <laughs> but you can't afford that money because you know the price of electricity is the price of electricity. Well, somehow you need to balance those objectives. And that's what's meant by you know, a, a business excellence model. You're really taking an integrated approach and that's what's required in the nuclear industry. Um, and there are uh, guidelines on that that are published by the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, which is an American organization. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, some ideas here on uh, how, how those uh, traits um, would feed into an, a company. So if a company wants to join the nuclear industry or it, it's, it's uh, already in, um, they, the, these are some of the things that it should be thinking about because without a, a business excellence model um, underlying uh, its activities, um, there could be difficulties and those difficulties would cost the company quite a lot of money and time and in lost orders, for example. So, you know, we really need to up our game if we're going to build nuclear power plants on time to budget. Um, just a couple of diagrams here about how the business excellence model 
uh, encompasses both the management system, the culture of the organization, the leadership that's necessary, and how partnerships are forged. Within the business uh, excellence model, again, you know, just focusing back on that, that one component, the management system here, here, then we can look at the management system has a quality management system within it. And that's where your plan, do, check, act cycle comes in. So that's how it all fits together. And, um, you know, I'm, as I said, uh, I, I welcome some questions. I've tried to look th more thoroughly, perhaps, at the quality side than the economic side. Uh, but there's a lot of information in our uh, report. And you're very welcome to try to, to, to get hold of a copy of that from our website. So thank you very much. Uh, just to sum up, uh, exceptional performance is quality management system, which is, involves procedures, human performance involves capability, safety culture is about mindset, and having a business set, excellence model requires management focus. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Greg, for your presentation. Yeah, will be very interesting for everybody. Eu gostaria de, antes de chamarmos o Dr. André Luiz Salgado, eu gostaria de dizer aos senhores que podem formular, usar o nosso chat para formularem as questões e aqueles que necessitarem da, de fazer a tradução em inglês e português, ou português e inglês, na teclazinha aqui embaixo, uma depois do share screen, entre recall e reaction, existe o globinho que pode se fazer. Eu gostaria de dizer a todos que, se vocês têm perguntas, vocês podem escrever em cima do chat, e nós temos o botão de tradução, e você pode clicar no globo para acessar a tradução do português para o inglês, e do inglês para o português. Ok, nós teremos agora é, quatro palestrantes, são palestras de 10 minutos cada. Four speakers, speaking e, ten final, minutes each. nós teremos um tempo para debate. At the end, we'll, we'll have some time for debate. O engenheiro André Luiz Salgado é graduado em Pernambuco. Ele é federal de Pernambuco. Em 2011, fez o em gerência de negócios na Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Iniciou sua brilhante carreira na Coblitz Limitada. E após a edição da Coblitz pela Areva em 2011, foi designado como diretor da Areva no Brasil. In Arriva, he was the director in Brazil. Dirige as atividades da parte nuclear da Areva para o Brasil e América Latina. He directed nuclear activity in Brazil and America Latina, Latin America for Arriva. Até 2018, quando a comprada pela Fremantone, when Arriva was acquired by Fremantone. F da Mitsubishi. Heavy Industry e a France Assistant. E atualmente, o Dr. André Salgado é o vice-presidente da Fremantone. Dr. André Salgado é currently the president of Fremantone. André, seja bem-vindo, meu amigo. Estamos lhe escutando. André, bem-vindo, meu amigo. Estamos lhe escutando. Obrigado, Carlos. Obrigado muito, Carlos, por suas palavras. Obrigado, Greg, pela brilhante apresentação. Obrigado, Greg, por a maravilhosa apresentação. We had so many details to aid our discussion. I'll make a very brief presentation here. To help in the discussion too. We have many speakers. 
each one of them will certainly bring their own views. And I decided to bring the views of a foreign company. A foreign company that's been in Brazil for quite some time. Particularly at a time in Brazil when there's lots of opportunities. His presentation had some kind of a problem, but anyway, I'm going to talk about Framatome only because I want to make an introduction. It's a company that, as Carlos wrote or said, it has 60 years of experience. It's been building, supplying, and integrating and maintaining nuclear plants around the world. High performance, it's been working on high performance and uh, nuclear plants that are secure and competitive. We're talking about OEMs, uh, original parts manufacturer, and we have many plants around the world. And we need, we've been providing services around the world in many different countries. In 2019, we had approximately 3.5 billion euros in sales. Our main activities are related to the manufacturing of components for nuclear plants. And this is particularly useful for nuclear steam production and the production of fuel. And the project for many other projects. as well as the providing of service for different activities around the world. Here in Brazil, the nuclear sector is going through a very dynamic time. It's growing uh, recently, and we see that the solution is being equalized at ANGRA 3. Now, we need to see how things go financially for this project and how this will be carried out, but at least the definition of how it, the decisions will be made is pretty clear. And we can start to see how things pick up starting next year. And then we have LabGen, which is Hello. in full development. And recently, we see that the project has been very idle, and we have many different components in that system. The RMB, the multipurpose reactor in Brazil, has for some time been developed, and we have the pride. We're very proud of how it's being produced and that it's being produced in Brazil, particularly by the CNEN, within a very short deadline. Recently, our minister made an announcement. He said that there would be a new regulatory body and this would be derivative of CNEN. And this has been a topic of debate for quite some time in Brazil. We need an independent regulator that can be a little bit more agile and provide better services to the nuclear sector in general. The National Energy Plan also provides us access to public consultation and we know that there's these extra uh, additional 10 gigawatts in nuclear by 2050, and that's very exciting. Within this context, we are always thinking about what is necessary 
to move forward. We have PNE, the National Energy Plan, and we understand that we need to drop the capex so that we can bring new plants, new nuclear plants online in Brazil. It is possible to make this happen with the capex right now. Uh, so, but we need to do more. And the nuclear benefits, I think we all understand them. Those of us who are here, we know that they're competitive, but we have a problem with this source because it has many attributes that are obviously essential for the Brazilian grid because, of course, it's clean energy, have a large share in Brazil. We need to keep our energy to reduce our capex, though, we need to have more guarantees. A, we need minimum planning guarantees. We would need to have a mid and long-term outlook for the PNE, the National Energy Plan, so that the companies in the sector would be able to believe and transform that vision into real planning so that we can actually carry these things out towards really building these plants in the future. This isn't necessarily all going to be reactors, as we said recently, uh, as, and it was stated by Minister Bento Albuquerque, but we know that the SMEs, uh, they are going to be on this uh, grid and they're going to be providing this new technology a regulatory framework that is well established is also very important for all of our activities, particularly in the nuclear activity, so that we can monitor the development of these product, projects over the long term. And finally, we need to have scale. Any construction project for nuclear needs to not only show the central project, but also several different projects so that we can show the scale and that way we can localize these different projects. And then little by little, we can start talking about our supply chain that needs to be prepared with qualified people, skilled people with certifications and people and industries that just like the people that Greg just mentioned, these things need to be implant, implemented. We have an industry that can take on these challenges for sure. How will we tackle this and come, overcome these barriers? Well, basically we need to uh, have skilled workers and that's one of the most important factors we have a lot of nuclear energy here in Brazil, particularly uh, here, in, you know, we have lots of people working in the nuclear engineering sector. And one of the things that brings us uh, success that we can look at as a benchmark in the past is that we have been able to achieve the agreement between Germany and Brazil. And this has led to a series of exchanges with engineers that provide us on the job training in Germany. And we have a series of specialists that came and delegations here to Brazil. And this also ensures the uh, transfer of technology and know-how and it also made it possible back then, it made it possible for those industries in NUCLEP, for example, to participate on this panel and in others. And they managed to develop a lot of the potential that that agreement made possible. What can we do now? Well, in the short term, we have the initiatives 
of Abdem and Sebrae to start the qualification and skill building of our workers so that we can start the supply for INB and other local industries with the uh, standards that are necessary. We can prepare those suppliers so that they supply to international companies like Framatom, who is always looking for local suppliers that can actually meet the requirements for supplying in Brazil and also for export. That's a taboo that we often need to discuss and tackle. We need to not only supply here in the Brazilian market, but also out of Brazil. We need to provide the volume so that we have the investment necessary. I also have a personal outlook on this, which is that Brazil has a lot to do with the digital uh, sector, cybersecurity, blockchain, all sorts of things in the digital area that have to be developed and that can be developed without such a high cost. And we can put, you don't need to have so much investment in the industry or programs for training professionals. This would allow us to not only provide our local market with people and technology, but also the international market. Now to wrap things up, because I'm almost over time, we need to have more stability. We need a framework that is a regulatory framework that is stable, that can provide us with a long-term outlook for the nuclear industry. We also need to think about preparing right now what we're going to do to make skilled workers, our technicians, to be able to transfer their knowledge to our younger generations of technicians. We know that there's a lot of uh, skill that we're losing with the uh, with the retirement of the older generations. And so that information has to be passed on to the next generation. And finally, we need to really work hard on implementing quality so that we can get ready for future opportunities. These opportunities for partnership with our traditional nuclear suppliers are not only uh, international, but also we, we're talking about international and national suppliers. And these suppliers should all have a very important role to play in our industry so that we have more synergies and we can develop even further. In addition to all of this, we must think about the social development which is extremely important when you think about Brazil and its context. We can bring lots of private investment and human resources. We have a lot of things, the nuclear medicine, and all of this context creates a series of uh, skilled jobs. And this is all something that we need to do. We need to create skilled jobs, uh, jobs basically in Brazil. And then finally, we need to talk about the strategic issue, which is the research in development, uh, as well as the military area. We know that they play a very important role for the strategic uh, position of Brazil. So for all these reasons, thank you for this opportunity to be a part of your debate today. Okay, thank you, Andre. You brought so many issues to the fore, and we're going to bring them all together here and talk about them in the context of the other presentations. Now let's move on to our next presentations. Now we will give the floor to uh, Carlos Seixas, who is 
going to be talking to us. He is from the Navy Reserve. He's the he's been an admiral since 2010. He graduated uh, from international institutes, and he was worked in the sciences. Our admiral Carlos Seixas, you are always up to date on the latest information, financial, scientific, and all the activities that take place both outside of Brazil and Chile and the United States, for example, including Brazil. First, he started out as an executive director and then moved on to become the president of NUCLEP in 2017. Admiral Carlos Seixas, I'm going to give you the floor and thank you for the opportunity to have you here and giving us your presentation. Well, hello everybody. Thank you, first of all, to all the wonderful words from Mr. Frady. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Greg for his presentation on management and also from Framatom talking about the different things there. Thank you, Andre. My name is Carlos Enrique Seixas. As you said, uh, Mr. Freitas, I've been working for a long time, and now I'm the president of NUCLEP. And I participate here with the international partners it is an honor for NUCLEP to participate in this event, which has been organized by the WNA, as well as in partnership with our ABDAN. Just to give you a brief overview of the role NUCLEP plays in the nuclear sector in the world, it's important to say that NUCLEP was a company created in 1975, and it was inaugurated in 1980 in May of that year. And it was built and conceived of in that time within the idea of a nuclear program for Brazil. And so that was a time when we were thinking about building several different nuclear plants. We manufacture equipment that is of the highest strategic importance for Brazil. We look at opportunities for business internationally with huge capacity for developing and uh, providing experience that is unparalleled at NUCLEP. Here, in Brazil, we currently have ANGRA 1 and ANGRA 2 operational. ANGRA 3, which is still under construction and not operational yet, but basically all of its equipment is being produced or is already produced and it's slowly being uh, supplied. These equip all these pieces of equipment will be delivered uh, soon, we have a uh, condenser that has yet to be delivered and some of the uh, accumulators. And these are under test in their testing phase. We also have been helping out with the building of the ANGRA units. And we are qualified to work on any nuclear construction production project in Brazil. NUCLEP is a strategic defense company. This strategic uh, aspect is precisely the fact that we have these ANGRA nuclear plants. We also have a lot of interest in building the multi-purpose reactor here in Brazil as we have mentioned earlier. It's called the RMB. This initiative that we understand will be carried out here in Brazil. NUCLEP is the only company in Brazil that 
it has the licensing and the qualifications to help build this multi-purpose reactor in Brazil. Our equipment and our workforce is specialized in the nuclear field. As was mentioned earlier, we have this pandemic has had an impact on us. And, but in spite of this, we also have the RMB, which is working uh, and we're making sure to provide jobs here. We have a company that provides opportunities for people who are specialized in our field. We have a lot of skilled workers who have been trained outside of Brazil, as well as in Brazil, in Germany and in France, for example, and they work in the technical area. Nuclef is, a, is one of the most qualified and skilled companies in Brazil in the nuclear sector. And I might even say it's one of the most qualified in all of the Southern hemisphere. And it is a strategic defense company that has been working for a long time with the Navy of Brazil. And it has a tight relationship with that uh, Navy so that they have been helping to build the nuclear propulsion submarine. We are working on the nuclear program in Brazil and it includes production of the lab gen. And this will help us produce a nuclear reactor that will put a prototype, a one for one scale prototype of the nuclear propulsion submarine at our group at Ipero in Aramar. This reactor from Labjin, which is being produced in Sao Paulo, and it's already there. Nuclef, in that sense, is participating in helping to build Block 40. Block 40, 40 is precisely the uh, block where this reactor will be housed. Nuclef is working at this right mo at this moment at Aramar, and it's helping to build this section of the reactor, the reactor vessel. And this is all ready to go so that we can use it in the Navy. Nuclep is a strategic defense company, as I mentioned, and it has unparalleled equipment that only Nuclep has. And also we have this very specialized workforce that works in this field. Thank you very much for your time and your interest. And I hope that we'll have more opportunities to work together and have more contact with regards to these results that we're going to obtain. Now I'm gonna show you some slides that might illustrate better what our capacity is in the heavy industries and particularly in the nuclear industry. So let me start this slideshow for you. Nuclep's mission is to develop nuclear and heavy equipment heavy industry equipment in the nuclear area. Oh, I think my slides aren't showing up on the screen. Is that right, everybody? Uh, you have to share your screen. No, we're not seeing your, your slides. Oh, 
I think it's coming. Just a second. Can you hold on for a second? I, I'm not sharing my screen, apparently. Just a second. I think that's just what I did. Do you have permission to share? Permission. Permission. Do you have permission? Oh. Oh, you managed to do it. Okay, wonderful. Okay, now let's continue with this presentation. So, as I was saying, the mission is to design, develop, to manufacture and sell heavy components and products for nuclear power plant shipbuilding offshore and others. We also get involved in mining and other things like that. What I'm showing you right here are a few of the pieces of equipment that Nuclep has built. And first of all, you can see a piece or a section of the submarine that we're building, these, this nuclear submarine. Oh, actually it's one of the uh, conventional ones that we've built. And just to give you a sense of how things are built, you know, here's the nuclear, or here's the submarine that was built by Electrograss. And right here, this is our generator. Or actually, it's a hydroelectric uh, turbine. And it just gives you a sense of how large it is. Look at the people there just for scale. And you can see how large this piece of equipment is and you know the breadth of the diameter. Now you can see here is our factory in Itaguaí. It was built in 1975 and it started in 1980 in May of that year. We have more than 1.5 million square meters. Currently we have lots of cooperation, but now we have 780 uh, workers and we're always looking for improvement, improved quality and skills in our workers. We also have a marine terminal and we also have the Rio Santos highway that passes right by our uh, factory, as well as the heliport and the mar maritime terminal. So all of these ways to get to and from our factory. Here is the strategic location of our marine facility. The solution that our uh, company has is that we managed to also have a rail line pass through our factory plant area. And this also provides us greater flexibility. Here you have an image, a uh, bird's eye view of the strategic location of our company. It's close to Rio de Janeiro, close to Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, and Angra dos Reis. You can see the, uh, the distance here on this slide. We have the Brazilian nuclear program based at Angra, which is only 85 kilometers away. 
And so that really helps us to not only build, but also to uh, be there to support the program so that we can meet their requirements. So we are close by and that's strategic. We also have a naval base close by. And this just gives you a sense of our strategic location. Here you have several different outdoor areas that NUCLEP has. Last year, we spent some uh, investment building with Petrobras, some new areas that can be used for building some of these equip pieces of equipment that we are building. Here, we have a picture of the outlet of one of our platforms that was built. And just to give you an idea of the size of the piece of equipment that is loaded on that barge. So you can see that we are uh, building the condensers and they might be of this size. And so that it would be shipped like this. We have several different photos of different pieces of equipment that we, this one right here, it's a base for a reactor at Atusha in Argentina. And just look at how large it is. Nuclep is really the crown jewel it's uh, serving so many people and so many countries and it's providing large pieces of equipment. Here's our laboratory. Here's a few pieces of equipment that are arriving at our company. Here's some inside the company. Here's uh, a big drill, for example. And here we have a submarine that is uh, it is conventional, but it's ready to go. And here's a platform for Petrobras. So you can see a series of photos here that shows the wealth of products that we have and that we produce. Here are some of our certifications. We have a seal that is the ASME seal. And only uh, NUCLEP has the ASME 3, which is a nuclear components certificate. And it's particularly used for nuclear equipment. And we have ASME 8, which is also very important because it provides the, val the validity for our work. And we also have the Defense Strategic Company certificate and many others that show the quality that we provide. And as has been mentioned before, we have many uh, workers, but a lot of them have been trained in Germany, for example, or in France with our, um, or through our agreement with France or with Germany. And of course, we have people who work on the uh, Navy side of things with the nuclear propulsion submarine. Here, what we can see is a little graph that shows our grid. And you can see the different breakdown of our grid, solar, nuclear, hydro, wind. And you can see that our nuclear uh, share, the share of nuclear on our grid is very small. It's only 2.1%, 21%, more or less 2% only. And our energy grid, right now, what we hope to do is increase that to 
about 8%. So what we are showing here is that there's a lot of potential and opportunity to build uh, the nuclear space. And we are, of course, dealing with many issues here because it's the government, it's politics. These are the different forces that will dictate the future of the nuclear industry in Brazil. The decision to make this investment in the nuclear uh, field is something that is going to have a, an impact on the nuclear industry, of course, but also it's going to have an impact on jobs because, you know, we can start producing more jobs and provide people opportunities in places like Pernambuco up in the Northeast if we build those plants that are slated for those places. So job generation is really something that we are considering as a major factor in the in this nuclear field because it's going to not only help the energy grid but also our families. All right, well, thank you very much. I think I've mentioned everything that I had to share about NUCLEP today. It's really been a pleasure to be a part of this debate. NUCLEP, as I said, is a heavy components uh, company and particularly a company dedicated to the nuclear industry. We are focused on a group of sectors that are looking to develop different areas, but we are mainly here, our reason for being is the nuclear area. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Admiral Seixas, for your speech and your lecture and your very clear explanation. I'm sure that we will have some questions to ask at the end of this session. And now we'd like to talk to Fernando Martins, who graduated in 1977 from the University of Rio de Janeiro. And he has more than 42 years of experience in managerial and technical aspects, both at Anchor One and Agra Two. And he's been a leader of international missions. And he's also been a technical leader. And he's currently uh, working at Tecnotom do Brazil. All right, well, please, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Mr. Freire, for your introduction. I wish to congratulate you all and the excellence that all of you work on. And it's great to be here and show what we're made of for our group, Technotum. It's really a pleasure to be a part of WNU and ABDAN and this meeting. I would like to start by making a brief introduction of Technotom. Our group has uh, uh, its base, its headquarters in Spain. We have more than 60 years uh, working in this field and we aim to serve implementation and service to our nuclear plants in Spain. And we are always working with those plants in Spain. And here in Brazil, Technotom has been around for about 25 years working at training the workers as well as um, providing, uh, we probably provide this training at our facilities. And we also offer services 
directly or indirectly, but most recently, we work on this uh, virtually. Anyway, and since 2013, we have been present here in Rio. I'd like to share some slides with you. Here's a map that shows our presence. You can see all of the continents, Brazil, Europe, France, uh, England, the United States, China, uh, South Africa. And we are present in many different. And this, all of this presence has allowed us to be here in Brazil. We have managed to have an exchange of services between these different countries. We also work on different products and we use the different skills that are present in each of these locations that we work in. Our supply chain if, aims to focus more on services than on products. Talking about the challenges that we have to tackle, our long experience has allowed us to make observations and take note of the discussion and the debate among all the different participants in this debate. Just to give you an idea of who works with us, here's our staff. We dedicate quite a lot of time and effort in terms of in retaining our staff, not just keeping them up to date and knowledgeable about the cutting edge information and technology, but also we invest in training them in new techniques. Here in Brazil, we have a focus on the institutions that work in the international level. And we try to get people to work in courses and other programs for training in the service providing. We have an accumulated experience and we're constantly renewing ourselves. We've been around for 60 years and therefore we implemented a platform that has allowed us to manage things very well and efficiently. And it has allowed us to bring, allow the people who are from the older generations to transfer some of that knowledge and so that they can, and they do this by being mentors to the younger generations of technicians. And this way we accumulate more and more information in our staff. Our platform uh, got started with, for our own benefit and we used it for ourselves. But now today we are providing this to other people, particularly in the United States, we are very active. And we saw that people started to use this platform in various different power plants. I hope that this platform will provide more opportunities and be useful in the future. Multiculturalism is also very important in our company. This is due to the need of expanding and the more we're expanding, the more it's necessary to talk with more people and have an easier exchange of information. 
between us here in Brazil and Spain, we find it, it's easy to speak, you know, Portuguese, Spanish, because we have, and with Portugal, we also have a common language, but we are also working on other languages like English. And all of this communication and our expansion has allowed us to have more interaction, more exchange because of the people from different origins. Now, most of our workers have higher education degrees. We have personal relationships with uh, lots of our workers. And this high degree of education allows us to provide better services to our clients. Here are a few examples of the work we do together. Here's the areas of work that we are engaged in, both here and abroad. We have facilities. The first one that's being highlighted are our training centers in Spain, for example. Once again, our instructors here in Brazil, they participated in training sessions for uh, different plants, both here in Brazil and abroad. And we are basically dealing with this new situation, the pandemic, which has only pushed us to work more online. And now we are providing um, things at a distance. And so this kind of exchange online virtually is become even more frequent than before. Here at Anchor One, we are able to also work together with different teams in our platform. For example, people from Anchor can work with Atucha uh, teams in Argentina. In terms of service providing, we know that it requires a large workforce to provide these services. We need technicians in Spain, United States, as well as here in Brazil. But we also send our professionals to participate in our in works at our Spanish plants. We've got people in Mexico, for example, and they also participate in this kind of activity. We provide products for security and safety issues at AMA. We also provide this for nuclear plants. These have these products have been produced in Spain and they've been qualified and uh, licensed. Uh, to be used in other parts of the world, like in Brazil. And this, we can use it to provide this kind of product here in Brazil. Here are some examples. I'd like to start by touching upon a few different items that have come up over the long history of our experience particularly when you talk about our labor force, both here in Brazil and abroad. Here's some things that I'd like to emphasize and I'd like to share with you. First of all, we have to meet the requirements we can consider the possibility of providing services. 
but we always have to meet the requirements. And therefore, we have here the, all the requirements that have been set by international uh, bodies. Although the rules uh, not, are not always that great, there are always some nuances depending on how things are perceived in one country or in another. Here in Brazil, for example, the uh, reactors are kept licensed, but we notice that they are still active and that things have been updated. And we need, basically this updating is based on the data. The data has to be constantly updated here in Brazil. And we see this work somewhere else in other parts of the country, of the world. So we always have to know in advance what the different requirements are so that we can uh, serve our clients properly and within the regulatory frameworks. Then next, let's talk about hiring. We have requirements for capacity building and We have different companies that are going to be working in the bidding process and depending on the moment and at the right time, they will act in this bidding process and it may seem simple, but they have to follow the rules. all of these different licensing pro processes and uh, regulations, they have to be seen as requirements and that we have to meet them. The second point that I'd like to talk about is that if we want to offer our services, we need to uh, see how attractive we are to our clients. What sets us apart amongst the others? that work in this service providing in the nuclear sector. We have a product that very few others have, and we know it's a very uh, rigorous product. We also know that our product, depending on the moment, is always unique and no other company can provide what we provide. So in the end, the, we also have to think about the price. Is it competitive? For example, if we need to provide a service abroad, at this moment right now, for example, we know that uh, we are dealing with exchange rates that aren't very uh, attractive for Brazil. But on the other hand, we look competitive to others because our currency is so low against the dollar. And so our relationship hasn't always been like this, but it's something to keep in mind. And then finally, we should think about the nuclear sector because there are many different companies that work in this sector. And we see that they are close to the point of service for logistic purposes. And so we need to always study this and consider it and ask ourselves, what kind of product or service do we want to offer? Another thing that we need to consider is what are the local alliances that we can establish? As a company outside of Brazil, as well as a company inside Brazil, 
that wants to export abroad, it's very important to have really good partnerships at the local level. We have this ability and we have searched for these local partners in different countries. That way we have a strong base that supports us in one way or another and we can provide our services and we can therefore provide services that nobody else can provide because those kind of companies, there's no company like ours in these countries. All of this brings me to another point, which I would like to put on the table. We have already seen things uh, come up, they've been discussed here, and I think others have mentioned that we had Angra One because it was our first nuclear power plant. We had very little uh, precedence in the nuclear world. We worked with Westinghouse, we have a good experience and over all this experience of commissioning and um, other things, we eventually found out that we had acquired something very unique. And then we had Angra 2. Angra 2 faced some problems. Uh, and that problem led us to send several people to Germany to learn more about the technology. And then those people played a fundamental role in the engineering and the qualification and licensing of our uh, power plant. I think that right now, what we're looking for is international partners, not only to bring new things and more fundraising and things like that, but we want to find ways to help the Brazilian government to further advance the Angra 3 project. But I advocate for the possibility of considering a requirement for local controls so that we have Brazilian companies participating in all these processes so that they can contribute to the knowledge that we are building. We have to do that now. And we have to recognize that very few private companies are working in this sector and that should be changed. All of this um, is working out pretty well. And I think that if we keep on working in this way, we can consider that we have our own know-how to contribute to the Brazilian nuclear sector and also that we depend on our own know-how just as much as we need know-how from abroad. I think that your participation here would be a way to make good on this idea. Let's think about UNB, for example, as an example. They and their operations on the fuel is very interesting. And they have really uh, advanced and not only here in Brazil, but now they offer their expertise abroad, like in the United States. And so they develop knowledge and they're able to share it. Now let's talk about logistics. I'd like to point out one thing, which is the work that's involved in logistics. We Brazilians, we think that processes in Brazil are often too complicated. Here in Brazil, here's what we think. The process is always look, we always look for the easiest and simplest of all processes possible. 
anybody that tries to do things, they really make it as easy as possible. But then when we look at our imports, we have to think about it in different ways. The processes are very sparse. Now let's talk about our nuclear area. We need to establish a good relationship with our clients. We now are picking up again with uh, Petrobras and others, and we've been called to participate together. We'd also like to be a part of the different discussions that are being held right now and share our opinions. And now we'd like to think about future plans. We've got iSuggestor and we need to uh, get ready for those things and qualify ourselves. And we need to think about the past and learn and take the lessons that we've learned and implement them to work better in the future. Here is an overview. We've talked about several different options or items here. We are present in several different countries, 40. We have a bit of culture from all the different countries that we are present in. And we have many different uh, power plants outside of uh, the nuclear area. Thank you very much for your help and your participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlos, for your participation and your presentations. All of your uh, comments and the questions for you are going to be in the chat and we will talk about them in the Q&A session at the end of this session. So feel free to uh, anybody who's listening to just participate in this uh, by putting your chat in your question in the chat box. in Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina, and the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA in US, as well as ACT as executive sponsor for Westinghouse Sustainable Service Center. Mr. Dembrak joined Westinghouse in 2007, and prior to that, he held the holders of increased responsibilities at Kurtz Right Flow Control, Union Switch and Signal, Bombardier Transportation, as well as 30 years in public service with the Department of the Navy as civil employee managing science and development programs. He holds a bachelor degree in electrical engineering, a master degree in engineering management. Dear friend and Mark, please give us your presentation. You are welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Freddie. I appreciate the uh, the very kind introduction, and uh, I uh, must say that it's been a very interesting session. Hopefully, for all of our participants, I know I've learned a lot, and uh, I just want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about my company and some of our views uh, as a, a global um, supplier, um, in particular working with uh, many different companies throughout the world uh, in 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 uh, the delivery of uh, products and services. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. As uh, Mr. Freddie indicated, my name is Mike Dembrak. I am the Westinghouse Electric Company Executive for Latin America. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, our perspective on uh, working in a global environment, in particular, uh, some lessons learned we have with working with many different partners uh, throughout the world. A little bit uh, in terms of history of my company, um, our company was founded approximately 130 years ago by George Westinghouse. Uh, George Westinghouse was a, a very uh, capable individual. Uh, and over the course of his, uh, his career, uh, he, he's established approximately uh, 60 different companies and individually received over 360 patents for his work. Uh, in particular, 
Uh, he was responsible for some of the world's greatest advances in energy technology. Most notably, uh, Westinghouse was the company that um, brought the world's first commercial pressurized water reactor into operation uh, in 1957 uh, in the United States. Although we are based in the United States, we have a global footprint. Uh, our, my company is based in um, Pennsylvania in the United States, but we have a footprint and location throughout the world. You can see from the map uh, that we have a presence on, on every major continent. Uh, in particular, we have an office uh, in South America. Uh, Westinghouse Brazil is based in Rio de Janeiro and works with um, all, of our local uh, all of our local customers uh, in South America. Just to provide a little overview for you, uh, Greg talked a little bit about the different types of suppliers that you're going to see in the nuclear business. Uh, Westinghouse is a integrated supplier of nuclear steam supply systems. And as of such, uh, we have all the major components that are required to provide these, these products and services. Uh, we have nuclear fuel, instrumentation and control systems, uh, components and manufacturing. Uh, we provide field services and plant modifications. Uh, we also in, are involved in the uh, development and, and um, delivery of new plant technology, uh, engineering services. Uh, we also work with, um, unfor unfortunately, a part of the nuclear business, as Greg indicated, was um, there are many plants that are reaching end of life and they have to go through a decommissioning process. We are involved in those products and services as well. But uh, basically, clearly, a fully integrated supplier for just about anything you would need in the nuclear supply chain. I want to spend a little time talking about uh, targeting one of our products uh, and services area. I know this is of great interest to Mr. Freddy. This is the business that he is in. And that is the delivery of uh, the engineering, manufacturing and delivery of fuel products. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the different technologies, but suffice to say, Westinghouse can provide fuel uh, products for uh, any type of commercial uh, nuclear reactor. Um, although we are the original equipment manufacturer for pressurized water reactors, we do have fuel products that work in boiling water reactors, VVERs, and also advanced gas reactors. There was a lot of discussion today about um, the challenges that are unique to the nuclear industry. Um, and as uh, Greg indicated when he kicked off the, uh, the session, uh, we are a, a established and, and somewhat aging industry. Uh, and, and there is uh, many different challenges that we have to face with the uh, continued operation of existing nuclear power plants. While there's a lot of discussion and, and Westinghouse is, is involved in this part of the business uh, with regards to the uh, design, construction, and uh, implementation of new reactor technologies, it's equally important to make sure that we work to extend the life of existing plants. Uh, and that is something that is a uh, uh, a, a very exciting part of our business and, and really a big focus for us currently in Brazil. Westinghouse is the original equipment manufacturer for the Angra One plant and Angra One is going through a very exciting phase in its life. We are working collaboratively with Electronuclear to extend the life of Angra One uh, for at least 20 years and possibly beyond. As part of that process, you have to have a very unique vision to focus on those challenges that you face to extend the life of existing plants. Uh, and this involves having innovative technical solutions. Um, you, you need to be able to bring experience. Uh, Westinghouse can do this from our industry leadership and engagement. Uh, a key piece of this discussion as we talk about uh, supply chain, it, you need to have a fully integrated expertise. So uh, it's important to be able to have the technical capabilities to design uh, and manufacture components, but you have to have a very um, integrated and, and established network of suppliers to be able to deliver your products and services successfully in a global fashion. And that's where the supply chain aspects of, 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 this, of this part of the business are very key. Uh, and once again, we do this collaboratively with both the customer and our suppliers uh, to be able to deliver um, products and services to extend uh, the plant operations. Very quickly focus through some of the unique challenges that customers face when they're looking to extend the life of an existing plant. Um, it's not an, always an obvious uh, answer, but how long do you want to extend the life of your plant? This determines 
what goes into the engineering uh, in the in the um, establishment of the program for that particular customer, uh, and and the, determines the rigor in which you go through um, the selection of, of systems for replacement or upgrade. Uh, what are your priorities? What are the plant asset, uh, uh, the, the plant systems that are giving you uh, the biggest problem? Uh, and many times certain systems are prob more problematic than others. And uh, so we try to work with the customer to focus on that. Uh, digitalization, how do we bring new technology into the mix? How do we integrate new digital systems with aging plant systems to to have the perfect marriage of existing and new technologies. Uh, how do we work to um, it, improve your system uh, performance, uh, your plant efficiencies? It's not just the core and triple S systems, but it's oftentimes um, how do you manage your workforce? How do you manage uh, the operational force? How do you manage the maintenance force? Uh, and last but not least, that leads into the discussion of people. You've heard that through many of the speakers today. It's not just the technical aspects of the project. It's how do we um, attract, train, and maintain the right uh, resources that we need to carry this industry uh, forward for, for many decades to come. So I'm going to talk specifically about the, the uh, supply chain characteristics. And this is from the perspective of being an, an original equipment manufacturer. So you need to adopt a global, regional, and local approach depending upon the market. And it's not a one size response for, for the market you're in. You have to understand your customer. Carlos Auton just mentioned that in the previous presentation. It's extremely important to understand the needs and behaviors of your customer, and you need to tailor your supply chain characteristics to their specific needs. Um, as a, um, an original equipment manufacturer and a global manufacturer, Westinghouse is experienced and developed local suppliers across the globe. And it's been a very key part of our success in terms of our ability to do that. Uh, we are experienced with supporting and managing long-term operations of multiple plants across the globe. One aspect of maintaining an aging nuclear fleet is you have to have a very capable uh, nuclear parts organization because you are dealing with supporting customers that have a wide range of needs. So Westinghouse is the original equipment manufacturer and as such, we have the designs of many of these systems and equipments but it also involves having strong relationships with third-party suppliers that can provide other components that maybe are outside of the OEM realm, but are so critical to plant operations. And in, in establishing those relationships and having suppliers that are capable that you can trust are extremely important in order to maintain um, your customers' needs. I want to highlight a little bit about uh, our experiences with um, INB, which is the organization that Mr. Freddy is responsible for. And this is a unique relationship, and that's why we wanted to talk about this uh, during the session. Um, INB plays um, multiple roles in its relationship with Westinghouse. INB is a customer of Westinghouse. Uh, Westinghouse provides um, components for the manufacturer of fuel for Angra One. We also work to provide nuclear codes and methods as part of a technology transfer. We work collaboratively um, to develop uh, next generation fuel technologies. We did so for the 16 by 16 fuel that's currently being used at Angra One. But correspondingly, INB is also a supplier to Westinghouse. Uh, INB has a very capable skilled workforce that uh, is involved in the, mo the movement of fuel and provides technical services to the Angra, Angra plants uh, in, in Brazil. Those skill sets are of value outside of Brazil to support customers in the Westinghouse global network. And so uh, just as a matter of fact, during this past fall outage season, IMB fuel movers were critically involved in several outages in the United States uh, and were of great support to Westinghouse and our customers in the United States in the execution of those outages. So I uh, want to thank you, Mr. Freddy, for, for providing such a capable workforce and hope to continue this relationship for many, many years to come. And last but not least, in the development of our, uh, of our technologies uh, with um, INB, we have a very robust technical exchange program that involves uh, resources in Brazil, the United States, and Sweden. So um, you know, as we've talked about, there's many aspects to having a successful delivery portfolio. It's technology, it's people, um, and, 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 and this technical exchange program has been a very, very critical part uh, leading to the success of our relationship with IMB. 
In particular, I want to talk about some lessons learned with regards to um, challenges with developing a local supply chain in support of new plants. So we've, we've talked a lot in this presentation about the unique challenges associated with maintaining existing plants, um, but there's also some very unique challenges with requ required to developing local supply chain for new plants. Um, Westinghouse is the original equipment manufacturer for the AP1000 um, large scale reactors. Uh, those reactors uh, have currently been um, brought online in China and represent the first new plant designs that have been implemented in, in many, many years uh, globally here. We would not have been able to do that without a very strong local supply chain uh, in the Asian Pacific Rim. Uh, in, in order to do that, you know, we've learned many, many different things, some, of, some that have worked, some things that haven't worked. But one of the things that we felt that was very, very successful for us is we need to be able to utilize a risk-informed sourcing in order to characterize the risk associated with parts. And, 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 and really, it, it's, 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 it's key to be able to, it's not just for parts, I mentioned it as part of the, the parts and components, but it also you know, extends into your understanding of the, the workforce. And so based upon the type of criti the, the criticality of the components and the systems that you're procuring, it determines your risk tolerance and, 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 and the challenges that you have with working with local suppliers. So you know, by, by percentage, a large majority of the components and, and services that you need to procure would fall in what we would call the low risk category. So these would be non-safety related components. And what it does is it opens up a wider portfolio of, of uh, suppliers that we can work with. And Westinghouse has, has been able to successfully take advantage of that. As you move into some, some components that have some more, more stringent requirements, uh, structural mods, some critical valves, heat exchangers, pumps, that raises the bar uh, in terms of the capability and you're working in a medium risk category and that probably is about 25% of the components that you source. That, that requires a, a, obviously a much smaller group of companies that, that have the capabilities to provide that. Um, and last but not least, we get into the most stringent requirements. These would be what we would call the higher risk components. Uh, this represents a, a, a minority but a very, very important minority of the suppliers that we deal with. This would be primarily focused on large safety related components, uh, nuclear steam supply components, uh, nuclear island cranes and the like. Uh, for example, um, I would say there are a very, very small number of suppliers globally that fall into this category. I would give you an example. Uh, uh, the Admiral spoke about NUCLEP's capabilities. NUCLEP would be an example of a company that has the capabilities to work in this very challenging and unique high risk category. So some general lessons learned on developing local suppliers. Uh, and, and this has come with, with many, many years of, of, uh, of good and bad experiences. Uh, one of the things as an OEM, you have to overcome any preconceived notions you have about the capabilities of local suppliers. Westinghouse has been very pleasantly surprised in, in all of the regions of the world that we work in, uh, in terms of the capabilities of our local suppliers. They have pleasantly surprised us in many, many cases on what they can do. And, and they have made us as a company much stronger and improved our ability to perform for our customers in the regions that we work in. But in addition to providing the actual capabilities in, in the actual delivered product or service, they have an incredible amount of experience on understanding local regulations, requirements, and expectations. That is extremely key in order to be successful. Um, as you are looking at other suppliers, uh, they are capable to help you and advise you as an OEM uh, in, in the area of due diligence and helping develop risk management strategies uh, on customer-directed suppliers. So, you know, there's multiple roles that you can have with developing local suppliers that you have a relationship and that you trust. Uh, it's very, very key to success. Um, local engagement with suppliers is essential. That's obvious from my comments. Uh, and there are some very unique requirements that, that, that you have in each of the countries that you operate in. Brazil is no different. There are very specific regulations for importation, exportation, value added taxes, and et cetera. And they can be very challenging to navigate those, those requirements if you don't understand what they are. And so uh, it's extremely key to develop partnerships and relationships with local suppliers that can do that. And last but not least, 
uh, you optimize the blend of your global, regional, and local delivery. Uh, I, can, I, I can easily say Westinghouse has developed um, relationships with suppliers that we have established through local projects that are now providing global supply of products to customers throughout the world. So it's, it's a very um, you know, strong symbiotic relationship that you develop with your suppliers, and it can be beneficial for both parties, not only on the project that you're working on within that particular country or region, but for projects that you may engage in throughout the world. Last but, last but not least, I wanted to give you an idea of uh, you know, all the possibilities for nuclear power's future. Um, as I indicated at the beginning of my discussion, it's an extremely exciting time uh, in Brazil. Uh, as Brazil looks forward uh, over the next uh, several decades and, and trying to develop a new, new generation baseload capability uh, as part of the 2050 plan, uh, there's many different technologies that can be used to meet those requirements. Obviously, we've talked, I've talked a little bit about Westinghouse's capabilities with large-scale reactors, in particular AP1000s, but also there is a potential role for small module reactors and even micro reactors. Each of these technologies have unique capabilities that can complement each other and can be deployed to meet um, a customer's needs. And I, it, it's exciting to see that Brazil is being very open-minded and looking at all these technologies as they look forward to meet the uh, increased requirements for baseload generation uh, in the decades to come. That's the end of my presentation. Hey, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dambrak. Nós avançamos um pouco no tempo, temos algumas questões aqui. E vamos colocar, procurando... We will try to come back to what was mentioned at the very beginning by our colleague, which was, I'll talk in English to be more faithful to the question. And R, do you think it can and lower the cost in supply chain? Well, it, <clears throat> this is a very, um, very interesting question. I, th I think the, um, uh, you know, uh, Mike um, Dembrank put it put it uh, very correctly that uh, large reactors still have a real, impo really important place in the electricity system. Um, so it's it's not really you're not necessarily going to replace. Uh, the, the large capacity that uh, a, a big plant can bring um, with, a, with, with uh, small uh, modular reactors, SMRs. Um, but um, SMRs, if, if, if you can really get uh, the scale of, uh, of uh, selling these uh, uh, modules, you know, to several countries, let's say, the same module produced in the same factory to several countries, you know, you're going to really massively uh, improve on um, the throughput. I mean, we know in the automotive sector that, um, you know, you can get dramatic improvement in, in quality uh, and reliability in the, the performance of of, of the product, um, you know, if you just regularly repeat what you're doing again and again and again, <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is substantial uh, cost savings there uh, to be had. So yes, if, if Brazil has got obviously many opportunities in the electricity system to uh, put SMRs in the right place, and Brazil has, as we, we've seen already, what uh, uh, Admiral uh, Seixas was, was talking about at, uh, the, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, at, at his facility. You know, you've got uh, the, the, the ability in Brazil to actually build SMRs if, if, if you know, there's a market for them. Um, so, you know, uh, that there are certainly opportunities there, not just for the smaller scale suppliers, but uh, for, you know, really making these modules 
in, in one place and shipping them to a variety of customers around the world. Essa foi, inclusive, uma questão colocada diretamente para o nosso presidente da Nucleb, o Almirante Seixas. This was even a question asked directly to the head of Nucleb. Because Nucleb has been working in the manufacturing of a reactor for a submarine of Brazilian Navy. How do you face it in regarding this experience and this learning, the possibility of the club manufacturing the SMRs? Are you, can you hear me? As I mentioned in the presentation, Nuclep has been working on these reactors for the submarine, as well as in the vessel for the reactor at LabGen. And we have great interest in developing the technology for the SMRs and the long modular reactors. And Nucleb has been working on developing these equipment to be able to meet the requirements for this uh, construction. But we are also interested in having a partnership with other companies that also serve this or service this kind of reactor. And so, we could build in partnership with others without any kind of problem. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a partnership. And maybe it's hard to do that here nationally, but maybe internationally we could have this kind of partnership and that would be very useful. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Admiral Seixas, for your answer. Another interesting question that we have here and getting back to this current moment where we are in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. At this time in this pandemic, we have faced many different difficulties for maintaining our nuclear power plants, not just here, but everywhere in the world, even focused here in Angra 2. Now, my question is whether we believe that foreign companies could be encouraged to establish partnerships with local companies here in Brazil to provide this kind of service. I don't know who would be the best person to answer this question, but I think it's a very interesting question and I think that we could think about the support of maintaining these different nuclear power plants. Uh, Commander Freire, this is Carlos Otto. If you allow me, uh, we are currently living and experiencing this kind of situation. When we had our team of 15 professionals who carried out the work for tube, tubing and other things over one month or a little more. And we also had to deal with the arrival of foreigners. The uh, speaker has gone mute. His microphone is on mute. His, the speaker's microphone has been muted. Your microphone is on mute. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, now you're back. Okay, you can continue. Within our strategy for our business strategy, 
whenever we talk about a country, we always look at the resources that they have and the technicians that they have. And therefore, we have always developed this capacity and the ability to work on this. And that's what we did with uh, 80 different Brazilians who currently work at ANCRA. Of course, we have some foreigners, but sometimes some people might have more advanced technology or whatever, but uh, you know, eventually what happens is that we do have to depend on some foreigners because of that technology. But for the most part, we really rely on the local staff. Oh, Commander Freddy, could you allow me? Yes, uh, I'd just like to add here a few words. It's a concern that is very important here at uh, Traviton, Framaton, we have been increasing our uh, share of different people and we've increased our partnerships with different companies that work with the plant. And this partnership is always in addition to the scope that is mandatory. And this has been a very successful factor for us in our campaigns. But there is a problem. And I think Carlos touched upon it. It has to do with the level of our specialists because we don't have the number of plants that would require to keep these people employed all the time in Brazil. And so these hot, more specialized people, they have to come from abroad because here in Brazil and Argentina, we just don't have the capacity to maintain those kind of people full time with that level of specialty. And therefore, at any kind of plant scale, the, the scale of the plant is really going to help us build that kind of specialty. So if we scale up, we're going to be able to keep these people employed long term, full time, without having to depend on the foreigners and their specialty. And so, of course, this gets to the chicken and the egg, but I think that, yes, we have this kind of challenge when it comes to setting up a local team and a highly specialized team. Thank you so much, Andre, for adding that. It's always a problem. Um, when we think about scale, particularly when we think about the different areas of uh, work that we work in, uh, and especially here in Brazil in our nuclear area. Another thing that's been very interesting that people have uh, talked about, and I know we are a bit over time here, but there's a question that has come up. What would be the main opportunities for creating a cluster in the northeast of Brazil. How could we have a broad uh, partnership? This was a question that came up. What would be the time frame for this kind of cluster? Well, I don't have the definitive answer, but I can add something about what I think would be necessary when we talked about uh, training personnel and how this depends on the scale that we have and the ability that we have to attract the manufacturer in Brazil of larger and more components, that's going to be a, it's going to require more specialization. So the cluster would really depend on the type of product or service that you aim to produce. And I think that the nuclear industry is very uh, localized in the southeast of Brazil. We're talking about Rio de Janeiro and a little bit in Sao Paulo with Iparo and Latgen and the others. But 
basically the building of a cluster in a different region like the northeast of Brazil would have to be a government decision. There would be taxes that would have to be involved and we'd have to encourage a productive chain that would of course provide benefits, but at the same time for right now, it would be because we don't have Itad de Bupa at this moment to build, but I think it's gonna be far fetched for us um, in this market where everything is localized down in the Southeast, it would be hard to have something in the Northeast. And so it would be up to the government to make that decision, but uh, that's my two cents. I have another question from the moderator with regards to Jose Medeiros. What would we need to meet the nuclear demand at Anchor 3 and the multi-purpose reactor? Of course, this isn't the focus of our presentation, but UNB has been working on tests and we hope to have things ready by the end of the year. And we are advancing to make these things happen. And we are working on a applying the capacity to get 400 tons per year. At the same time, we are actively working in Santa Quiteria in Ceará State, and it's a very um, fruitful partnership, and there's lots of investment. And UNB and Galvani are working on phosphates in the north, and they're working on a phosphate mine. And of course, this is a uranium mine. We are doing everything we can to develop our partnership. We have picked up on the nations. We have people working on this field. And it's going to be a mine that's going to provide us with production of almost 200 million tons per year. And I think UNB needs to have a, a goal for anchor one, two, and three, and the production of fuel that we need to make. And I think that we will certainly be able to serve even what is being set out in our national energy plan. And it's also gonna allow us to make that major jump uh, from eight to 10 gigawatts and building these additional nuclear power plants. We also have on the radar, the multi-purpose reactor and others. So yes, UNB is going to be ready at the right time to supply the Brazilian sector with uranium. There's yet another question that's been asked here, and it's a very interesting. This question is, how do we see the, what is the role of the smaller uh, producers in the supply chain? It's a question for Mr. Greg. Yes, well, I, I, I think this is, um, uh, uh, this is one of the challenges, I think, for the industry because, um, uh, you know, all, all, there are quite a lot of small companies involved in the service side of the nuclear industry, but perhaps not so much on the manufacturing side. Um, uh, in fact, a lot of manufacturers who supply the nuclear industry, you know, are 90% involved in non-nuclear work. You know, their nuclear work is often just a small part of what they're doing. And these are quite important, large, well, they're not huge companies perhaps sometimes, but uh, many of them are, are uh, uh, you know, substantial 
companies with international presence. They're working in several different parts of the world quite often. So I think the really small companies, um, you know, we, we, we see most of them involved in the, the, the service side and perhaps construction side in the nuclear industry. Uh, there's certainly a lot of scope for um, small flexible operations. Um, but, you know, when, when we're talking manufacturing, it's, it's very difficult to see where, where very small companies can really fit in. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Greg, for your Mas vamos ter que encerrar, infelizmente, a parte está bastante interessante. We are going to have to bring this to a close. This discussion is very interesting, uh, but we have to stop. Uh, thank you very much, Celso, for making this very interesting debate possible here within the context of WNU. Ever since the very beginning, we've been having a good time. And I'd also like to uh, say thank you. It's great to see you all and all the other participants. And I wish you all a very good evening. And thank you, Celso. I think you might like to add something before we close things at this high level debate. Good evening, hello to you all. Let's go and have some rest. I think we all deserve it. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Goodbye, Greg. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Michael. Thank you. Boa tarde a todos, hein? Boa tarde. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you to everyone participating. Thank you. Good night.